maybe just a, another framing or threshold question around alpha, because I think this is now, you know, we're retreading this a little bit, right? We're reframing this a bit. So I know, Jackie, in your previous panel, there was a discussion around diversification as a, let's say, component of alpha that hedge funds bring to the table. How do we feel about that? Is that, you know, is this, is this enough having these like diverse exposures? Um, you know, I think the traditional notion of alpha, if we go back to the, you know, kind of cottage hedge fund industry 25, 30 years ago, I think might've been a little bit different exploiting inefficiencies, but today, there's a lot more market efficiency. So how do you feel about this maybe newer definition of alpha? So, you know, diversification is, um, it's a good thing, but there can also be a situation where too much diversification yeah. diversifies way returns. Yeah. But one thing that uh, we find intriguing now that we think is um, interesting opportunity set is to be leaning into strategies that are volatility friendly and have, are positively convex because you know it just feels that we're no longer in a regime of of low you know equity vol um it, it's come off a bit since this surprise natural uh, retracement rally we saw recently but still uh, gone are the days of a vix of 10 you know rate vol is also uh, uh up and it's going to be up even more as we're transitioning in monetary policy to possibly a different regime over the next year so there's going to be elevated levels of uh, volatility. So it would make sense to lean into strategies that are vol friendly and to be a bit more cautious in any strategy that uh, uh, you know, has a, a short vol bias because eventually you know, uh, mistakes do happen and uh, those could be painful. So I just think um, that a lot of the alpha is going to come in from uh, leaning into positive convex strategies. Any areas there that uh, you, you don't like, right? Are there things there that you sort of say, mm, not, not exactly what I'm looking for? Well, I mean, just uh, uh, in general, I would think, you know, uh, you have to, it's going to be a lot of dispersion among strategies, but also you have to pick your spots within equity, long, short, and credit. A lot of uh, hedge fund strategies in general usually have a positive bias. Uh, a lot of, you know, long, short managers are either, they have two speeds, they're either long or longer. You know, they usually don't go short. Um, same thing with credit managers, uh, you know, emerging markets. There's always a bias for carry and things like this. So I just have to say, you know, more than ever, people have to be critical about understanding where are the sources of alpha coming from, what are the return drivers, what are the factors driving that. So I just think um, uh, people have to be even more aware uh, before than packing the return yeah. one. And so Art, maybe sticking with you here, the uh, discussion around diversification, like the new notion of alpha, and then maybe we could pivot into, and we'll go down the line here, just areas where you're hunting for that alpha. I think it'd be good now to maybe talk to the audience a little bit about where we have conviction, where we're looking, um, you know, what are some of the things that, that are getting us excited, particularly as we go into this newer regime? Um, sure, just to add what Jackie was saying, the um, higher rates and volatility in general are favorable for hedge fund strategies. Um, higher rates mean higher dispersion, uh, greater dispersion of outcomes means that you can make money on both the long and the short side. And uh, there's also elevated tail risks. And again, uh, there are certain strategies where you can benefit from, from that elevated volatility. On the rates uh, side specifically, it's important to know that a lot of hedge fund strategies are actually floating rate uh, as you look through the, uh, through the factors that drive their returns. Merger arbitrage, there's a risk-free component built into that. Uh, long short equity, there's the short rebate that you get, you know, that, that picks up on the, on the short side. So um, we're not oblivious to those risks. Obviously, you know, rates have moved a lot in, in the last year and a half. But looking forward, projecting what uh, kind of the, the stop in rising rates and what that means for hedge fund strategies, there are certainly areas where being long optionality that's built into the strategy is favorable for you. Uh, so areas that we are really excited about, discretionary macro, uh, I think that's a strategy that's done well in recent years and we think it will continue to do well just because there's so much dispersion between, even within countries, but even more so across countries, across central banks, uh, across currency regimes, geopolitical factors and so on. That's certainly an area we like a lot. Risk mitigation strategies, again, long optionality, whether it's explicit or implicit in what they do. Uh, we have a very sizable risk mitigation business uh, that we've built up in recent years. Um, again, just the possibility is there to make money being long options. Not to say that uh, you will, you, you know, certainly a lot of options expire worthless, 
but fundamentally that is the one area where you at least have the possibility of making some money should there be a dislocation, should volatility pick up. Thanks, Art. Any reactions there? Or we could turn to Ansofi and Mark, maybe about your areas, where you have focus, where you have sort of conviction, but please. Trying to unpack some of that. I mean, there's a lot of content here. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly on top of uh, what has been said, diversification can be somebody's worst friend. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if you have more than 30 stocks in your portfolio, why don't you just buy an ETF? Okay, at the end of the day, you need to pay for concentration and for high conviction. Same thing when it comes as a CIO into the uh, art of constructing a relatively balanced portfolio. How many lines, how many strategies would I want in order to say, well, this is what I'm going to deliver to, um, to investors? So let's say we have 200 strategies and maybe 50 which have passed Occam's razor of various criteria. My bet is that past 15, 17, you're not going to add much. And if we push the logic even further, the more and more line and the more and more diversification you're going to get, you're going to get the risk-free rate. Mm -hmm. Someone should pay me to get the risk-free rate and invest in something which has 10 plus or 15 plus volatility. That's the conundrum of diversification. The second thing is that diversification is highly elusive. So I would never measure it you know, over a long period of time because my life is much shorter than that. Okay, and even my investment horizon as an, as an investor and as someone who has to answer client calls would be a lot shorter than that. I would look into tail risk, I would look in asymmetric correlation and how asymmetric risk can shift the correlation away from the so-called usual uh, regime. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, any reactions or you want to build on that point? I could talk about other areas of uh, interest to lean into. Yeah, please, Jack. Yeah. So I think another area that's really interesting is uh, just the whole energy sector in general. Energy um, has woken up the last few months, but pretty much it was you know, lagging on the year. I could give you five reasons right now why I think um, energy markets should rally over the next few months. Um, number one is um, global inventories are pretty low and falling. We're off by over 150 million barrels um, in inventory from the highs of spring. And we're pretty much now approaching the lows in global inventory where we were in early 2022, right before Russia invaded Ukraine. And we saw what happened there. You know, oil markets rallied $25 because that was a part of the world that was very sensitive to um, oil exports. But um, it could happen. I mean, uh, inventories are pretty low. Uh, reason number two is um, the Saudis are really incentivized to keep um, oil production tight since their first production cuts in about a year ago, they've since uh, cut two more times, and it's in their incentive to keep um, revenues up as they're trying to fund things like Vision 2030. And uh, it's unlikely that they're going to uh, uh, loosen uh, this uh, anytime soon, although it's possible. Uh, reason number three, the speculative length now in uh, oil markets across uh, futures and options uh, in crude and other products is pretty low. Uh, so there's plenty of room for um, uh, speculators to participate on the upside if this ever wakes up. Um, oil has, been, has come off a lot because people were worried about recession fears. Um, there was uh, refinery margins came down because there was just a lot of product created. But still consumer demand is still there and that's reason number four. Uh, consumer demand is still there. If you look at um, the oil use for global transportation across uh, uh, jet fuel, gasoline, diesel, uh, it's up. It's a healthy 1.7 million barrels a day. It's up. It's increasing. Uh, satellite mobility data will show, you know, there's demand for that as well. And um, reason number five is the geopolitical risk. I mean, people would have assumed, given uh, the terrible news going on in the Middle East, people would have normally assumed that, that oil markets would go up. But it hasn't because currently the conflict, you know, associated um, what's going on in the, the geography it's not the uh, OPEC plus the major countries. It's not Saudi, Iraq, Iran, uh, Russia currently. But I mean, it can. Um, this is a very volatile uh, conflict. A lot of other regional actors could appear uh, in this. There could be supply disruptions. There could be oil strikes you know, on, um, uh, on certain oil facilities. Uh, the US could you know, put sanctions on Iran. Unfortunately, a lot of that oil uh, finds its way to independent refiners in China, so it's out of the jurisdiction of Western economies to enforce sanctions. But these are all things that could happen. It's a very complicated picture. And if you take away the recession fears that what brought oil down to these 
levels on this recent pullback. Uh, now we saw what happened last week, uh, post-Fed, post-payrolls. Um, uh, uh, bad news is good news, no more hike, risk rally. So it's conceivable, as the narrative goes, that maybe oil markets might be limited on the downside, and if anything, there's a possibility of a right tail. So uh, what it's, it's worth exploring some potential upside within oil, and you could do that in a variety of ways. Even with uh, long short managers that trade in the energy sector, there's usually higher alpha on the uh, easier alpha to get in the long side. And so it, it's just quite possible. So anyway, I'm, I'm very yeah. intrigued about it. Uh, oil equities especially have lagged a lot uh, of oil prices. So that looks particularly cheap. It's a bit of a contrarian view because, you know, recently we saw this pullback. But anyway, we're worthy of uh, looking into it. Yeah, the energy complex, a lot going on. Any, any views that speakers want to jump on there in the energy complex uh, or, or other areas? I'm not smart enough to predict uh, pricing of any one asset class. There's lots of people who try to do that. Um, it kind of goes counter to what we try to do, which is deliver diversification and exposure to other asset classes. I'll just stress the fact that, again, in my mind, alpha, the way to capture alpha is to go into places that are less efficient, that have non-economic buyers and sellers, that have, uh, you know, real structural inefficiencies that make it a difficult place to be crowded. Uh, structured credit, right? For, for years and years, people have paid it on structured credit just because it's complex, it's illiquid, it has tail risks. Uh, commercial real estate. I mean, uh, we, we're, we've all read thousands of headlines about how, how bad that market is. It is a, not a homogenous market. It's very local. It's very inefficient. I'm not saying go out and buy a bunch of commercial real estate. All I'm saying is, from an alpha perspective, markets like that, that are unloved, that are misunderstood, that don't, don't have enough people following them, that's, those are the places where, that we're interested in. Insurance-linked securities, volatility trading, lots and lots of places like that. Emerging markets, the more esoteric, the better. Um, just because that's where, in my mind, in, in this environment, that's, what, that's where the alpha is. It's not in trying to predict, you know, next quarter's Apple earnings. There's many, many more people looking, uh, looking and trying to predict that than, you know, what happens with uh, South African real estate. 